I thought the name <laughs> was actually an upper branch of Nirjan. Oh, no. Excellent. <laughs> Hi guys. Thankfully not. Thank you for joining the live stream. Today we have a phenomenal uh, guest whose uh, lecture on hermeneutics is one of my favorite things to look at from anyone from uh, the Indian, let's say, non-left scholarly side. Uh, we have with us Srijit Dotto, Professor Srijit Dotto, who is a philosopher, researcher, scholar, professor, commentator on socio-political issues. Uh, so thank you, Srijit, for coming on our podcast. Thanks for having me. Neeraj. And and he has given me the permission to call him Srijit Da, not not Sir. So that's where we'll start it from. Not permission. I'd be really happy if you call me by that. Okay. So, guys, uh, today's topic, first and foremost, is Indianizing Humanities uh, Academia. So, with that question in mind, sir, why does uh, uh, Humanities Academia seem to have mostly um, anti-India results, if not uh, direct anti-India intentions in their research? Right. So, the problem with the humanities uh, is uh, one of perspective and uh, uh, that perspective uh, is something uh, that skews the methodologies and tools related to or intrinsic to humanities disciplines um, against uh, our cultural ethos and even our political interests. So uh, at the beginning, I should say that uh, uh, it is uh, an established consensus in the humanities that uh, objectivity is a big no-no. So objectivity is not something that people strive for in the humanities. Uh, and uh, objectivity is taken to be, uh, if anybody is trying to be objective, that is taken to be a pretense. Why? And, because uh, is there argument that it's never possible? So why not just say what you want to say? No, it is because of the nature of truth, because of oh. the nature of phenomena and our experience. Hmm. So uh, that would be a little too philosophical if we go into it. Uh, without going into it, let me just say that uh, because phenomena uh, are unfolding before us in uh, such ways that our sense perceptions and our thinking tools, our thinking methods are not capable enough to uh, capture a 360 degree view of uh, a holistic view of uh, phenomena. And therefore, it is uh, uh, not uh, uh, blameworthy even. But the problem occurs when you try to adopt uh, such perspectives, which are not suitable to the cultural ethos and political interests of a people of a nation. Mm. And uh, uh, you start your premise uh, with uh, something like there is no nation to begin with there is no uh, people okay so that is something uh, that that uh, skews the whole playing field it does not remain level anymore and that has been uh, the main reason why history scholars uh, literature scholars uh, philosophy scholars and also religious studies scholars in recent times have come up with a literature which uh, instead of helping us uh, gain a, a wholesome idea of who we are, uh, it, it basically puts us in a position to go on doing more harm to our culture that has already been done by others, by foreigners, by those who are alien to the culture. Hmm. And, and uh, uh, the, the only way to change it is to take charge of that perspective and how the methodologies in the humanities are uh, put into place, put into action. And uh, that will help us, uh, first of all, gain the sense of a nation, a nationality, and then applying that sense of uh, a nation into doing humanities. Because, uh, you know, let's take the example of history. What is really the goal of history? That is a question that uh, people will uh, answer in these days in such vague terms as um, basically uh, narrativizing the struggles of uh, people who have been at the uh, uh, receiving end of tyrannies uh, from political as well as economical brute forces, Okay, so to speak. But that doesn't really mean anything because uh, in, in real world, it is not just political or economic factors that 
put people at a sort of receiving end from mm. uh, the titans mm. there are many more factors mm. including religion which is a big one mm. uh, and we have seen how religion can uh, make uh, the playing field uh, very skewed very very skewed we have seen it right from the beginning of uh, this century mm. uh, from 9/11 onwards mm. and uh, even before in our country we have seen it right from the uh, you know beginning of the republic of india from mm. the, the, the the very birth of the republic was uh, uh, painful and it was uh, based on partition and that very partition was based on religious mm. causes religious factors so obscuring that obfuscating that uh, uh, cultural religious linguistic factors can be um, playing a really big part in in this sort of uh, making people uh, uh, you know uh, weaker and uh, you know a section of people weaker and another section of people uh, gaining the upper hand mm. that has been one of the reasons that uh, put us in this uh, tricky position with respect to humanities right. and history in particular mm. so if we start taking charge of our perspective in writing history in historiography in uh, creating the uh, uh, the stories that need to be told uh, in order to gain a sense of our nationhood um, sense of uh, being a distinct people on earth this there is no escape from you know the kind of disasters that we have been seeing in the academia and the repercussions of those disasters in real world in more real world i'm not saying that academia is not real world hmm. but there are you know so to speak uh, yes. in terms of degrees right. more real worlds outside the academia hmm. and uh, we see political economic hmm. cultural repercussions of uh, the theories that have been created in the academic labs exactly. such as the kind of theories that have been created inside uh, you know the uh, frankfurt schools mm. uh, uh, precincts mm. so that is going to be uh, you know uh, the the main challenge for humanity scholars uh, scholars in history uh, literary theory and criticism religious studies including uh, comparative religious studies which is a really really big uh, field not field it, it i should really call it a discipline mm. uh, and uh, and also philosophy so these are the four main pillars of uh, humanities as a field and uh, now that uh, things are getting more and more uh, interdisciplinary mm. uh, uh, which means that multiple methodologies taken from different disciplines are coming together to create new disciplines mm. i told you about religious studies which is a relatively new discipline and uh, it has basically come from other fields like literature and history and philosophy mm. so uh, you know the disciplines of these different um, sorry the, the methodologies of these different disciplines have been taken together and integrated uh, a synthesis has been made and as a result of that we have uh, uh, we, we have received this new interdisciplinary uh, discipline so to speak uh, which we are calling uh, religious studies or comparative religious studies mm. and it has become uh, a sort of uh, uh, you know very contested field mm. in uh, looking at uh, religions like uh, islam christianity hinduism buddhism mm. uh, mainly these four mm. uh, so and in in the context of our country uh, it, it would be really really important to look at the kind of work that uh, scholars in comparative religious studies have done in the field of uh, especially buddhism and hinduism mm. so this is the sort of uh, challenge that we are looking at sir i don't know much about the field of religious studies i that i just know that there is a field called religious studies is it a fair criticism uh, that uh, only when it comes to hinduism studies it's not a real hindu religious figure who is teaching that whereas in every other religion it's probably a believer of that religion who is a devout religious leader of that religion who is actually the professor of religious studies Hmm. Uh, more or less, you can say that there is uh, some truth in that uh, critique, I see. but uh, that has not been uh, a ubiquitous, uh, uh, you know, phenomenon. You know, uh, because right from the very beginning, uh, we had people who were 
practicing Hindus. You know, in recent times, when I use this term practicing Hindu in uh, a social media post, people became really disturbed. But uh, I, I don't know. This is a fair uh, term, I think, to use. Practicing Hindus are those who who believe in the major tenets or principles of Hinduism, the Hindu way of life, and uh, the Hindu wealth and shaung or worldview. So um, we have seen people like Swami Agehananda, okay, who was uh, a scholar in uh, uh, anthropology to begin with, but uh, mm -hmm. he started to shift towards philosophy and then uh, started writing mostly on uh, religious studies. And he uh, gave some wonderful discourses, lectures, and uh, uh, papers, uh, even books in Hinduism in particular, and also in uh, Vedanta. Okay. Uh, not not saying uh, as uh, it as a distinct thing, but mm. in within Hinduism, he has focused more on Vedanta, mm. and uh, he has also uh, sort of problematically relied on this term called uh, neo Vedanta or neo Hinduism. Mm. So uh, this is uh, you know something that has come up only in the nineteen uh, seventies, I think. And Agehananda was also active from before. From 1950s. Uh, by the way, Agehananda was actually an Austrian oh, uh, national. Okay. okay, and uh, he's a very interesting, colorful uh, man. Uh, he had uh, some links with the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the Nazis uh, oh. as a young man. Right. Uh, but somehow uh, he uh, uh, left that life and he came to India. He discovered Hinduism. Uh, he took up sannyasa, he became a sannyasi, hence the name Swami Agehananda. I have actually forgotten his, uh, you know, birth name. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, he went on to become a very uh, good scholar of uh, anthropology to begin with in uh, Michigan University, Michigan State University hmm. in the US. And uh, uh, later on, uh, I think because of his uh, spiritual interests, he started to speak more and more on uh, Hinduism and hence his foray into religious studies. So that is just one example and how he sort of popularized the, the concept of neo Hinduism. I'll just uh, explain in our shell what is this problem you know, to suggest that uh, whatever uh, had happened in the late 19th century in India in terms of Hinduism uh, experiencing a, a, a sort of resurgence, some people call it revivalism and they use that term as a pejorative, as a negative term. Oh. So, uh, uh, you know, when people use this term uh, revivalism with respect to the phenomenon of uh, the Indian Renaissance or the Bengal Renaissance and the Hindu Renaissance, you can even say that, uh, they are basically using what uh, in anthropological terms so we call an etic perspective, mm -hmm. E-T-I-C, which basically means the perspective of somebody who is not a participant, not a nat natural participant in that culture. That not was my next natural. question. Yes, so that, that, not just natural participant by which I mean somebody who is born into that culture, mm. but it can also be somebody like uh, Agehananda who mm. uh, you know adopts Hinduism. Mm. Uh, it can be somebody like uh, Sister Nivedita, uh, mm. Margaret Noble, mm. uh, who was the chief disciple of sorts mm. of Swami Vivekananda. Uh, so yeah. there can be people who uh, who come from outside and then uh, adopt uh, a particular culture and then they become the complete opposite, sometimes complete opposite of this etic, which is uh, denoted by the term emic, E-M-I-C, mm. which means somebody uh, who's participating in a culture mm. and therefore speaking or describing or analyzing that culture from those on the basis of those experiences. Mm. Okay. So you can also call it an insider's experience. Right. I want it as a scholarly perspective versus a uh, practitioner's perspective. I wouldn't uh, uh, like to describe it in that way because uh, the practitioner can also be scholar and therefore in such cases the line between a mm. scholar and a participant mm. will right, become right. blurred. Mm. And um, also when you are uh, writing as a scholar, you have uh, uh, you have to basically look at the phenomenon from all sides. You mm. you cannot simply uh, be hegemonic or uh, you know or you cannot be uh, overtly emotional mm. in terms of uh, in terms of 
uh, describing your experience in a in a scholarly uh, article or book mm. let's say yes. uh, even though you can basically raise this question uh, of how to uh, distinguish between or rather how, where to draw the line with respect to being emotional and uh, you know capturing one's experience because uh, we have something called uh, phenomenology mm. uh, where uh, in philosophy particularly uh, where uh, phenomenological uh, accounts of a phenomenon can be pretty much based on one's participation mm. in a particular uh, situation mm. so uh, that is something that has changed uh, 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 the game and uh, people have often tried and some very good results have come out of it uh, but more or less we have seen those who are non-participants have been writing on uh, religions like hinduism mm. and as a result of that uh, many problems have cropped up okay mm. we have seen uh, that even some participants uh, uh, have created problems because they have not uh, they have not really adopted the insider's perspective mm. sometimes they have been uh, overtly using the etic or outsider's perspective mm. but sometimes uh, we have seen a mix of both okay mm. that that has also given rise to confusions for example in the case of abhay hananda mm. okay uh, because he uh, uh, relied overtly on uh, this distinction between neo hinduism and uh, sort of i don't know what will be the other thing classical hinduism or uh, mm. sanatana hinduism i don't know so they basically their premises that uh, swami vivekananda uh, uh, or sri aurobindo these kind of people had come up with a new version uh, of hinduism mm. uh, which has a distinct break from the kind of hinduism that people like uh, adi shankaracharya or madhava acharya mm. or uh, ramanuja acharya or even uh, sri chaitanya dev uh, mahaprabhu in bengal uh, have been practicing mm. uh, but they fail to notice the kind of continuity that has existed between the times of shankaracharya and uh, swami vivekananda mm. as examples okay there are many other figures representing both eras but i'm taking the example of these two mm. shankaracharya and vivekananda they they are not uh, two uh, extreme ends of a spectrum mm -hmm. there there is actually a line connecting them mm. a plethora of people uh plethora of texts mm. plethora of uh, discourses which connect these two and therefore it should be looked in that holistic sense which uh, which is somehow missed in the kind of uh, analysis that people like agehananda have given us and agehananda is even a participant so he is a good example of mixing up these uh, two perspectives and he can it and there have been others who are non participants mm. so they are looking at it from a complete outsider's perspective and they have created many more confusions so, so these are the kind of confusions that uh, exist and uh, you know the, the humanity scholars challenge specifically the religious studies scholars and philosophy scholars uh, challenges lie in those respects yes, sir. Uh, sir whenever i bring up this topic of uh changing anything within the academia because apparently uh, i'm only claiming unfairly that uh, it's leading to bad outcomes for for the country or the society uh, the response i get from my left left leaning friends or leftist friends is that who decides who is this we we are talking about who has to reclaim the academia and what is it based on would you would you uh, care to respond to that yes of course so as i see it uh, i i indicated right at the beginning of our conversation that first of all we have to have a sense of uh, the nationhood mm. uh, we have to have this sense uh, of who we are mm. without that any venture any intervention into the humanities fields uh, into the humanities disciplines uh, is going to be a unmitigated disaster the kind of disaster that we have seen uh from let's say 1950s onwards mm. okay from the time when uh, scholars like binoy shorkar or radha pumod mukherji or uh, you know even um uh, sir jodunath mm. uh, they were forgotten because th these scholars were simply forgotten right okay and uh, then there were uh, the other generation you know the generation next to uh, 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 people like binoy shorkar or radha pumod mm. uh 
you know, take the example of uh, R.C. Mojumdar, hmm. okay, or Horidash Mukherjee and Uma Mukherjee, hmm. okay. Uh, these are great scholars, hmm. and uh, they were still writing in those tumultuous Congress years, uh, down the 1950s, 60s, 70s, down to 2000s. I, you know, the, the last book of Horidash Mukherjee and Uma Mukherjee, uh, not last book, but rather the last edition, latest hmm. edition of uh, one of their books several of their books came up in the early 2000s mm. so uh, and also we know how people like uh, sitaram goel and uh, ram swarup have been working outside of the academia mm. there were some people uh, from outside of bengal who were also working from within the academia like uh, dr meenakshi jain mm. okay and there were people who were working from uh, within the mainstream media mm. uh, such as people like girilal jain father of Dr. Minakshi Jain, mm. okay, who has written the uh, very, very insightful book and a very bold book uh, called Hindu Phenomenon, mm. uh, right at the heart of those uh, tur turbulent years of Ram Janmabhumi uh, movement, mm. you know, in the 1980s, late 1980s. So there were a few examples of such people, but they were systematically sidelined. I mentioned the earlier generation who were outright forgotten. People like Dina Shankar and um, uh, Radha Kumar Mukherjee, uh, Juhuna Shankar, et al. Uh, and this other, the next generation, R.C. Mukherjee, uh, Kali Krishna Dotto, uh, uh, and uh, Oridash Mukherjee, Uma Mukherjee, uh, they were systematically sidelined. Mm. Now, in their writings, we get to sense a palpable feeling of who they are from where they are speaking. Okay. Right. And therefore, several of them self-identify as nationalists, as mm. Indian nationalists. Mm. I think it is critical for any humanities discipline scholar to first of all make up their mind which perspective they are going to adopt mm. before they venture into the, the, the writing of books and uh, you know uh, the creation of new knowledge. Mm. Unless they can make up their mind like this, whether they are nationalists or they are, I don't know, something else, postmodernists, they are, they are anti nationalists, they are internationalists. It can be n number of things. There cannot be a, a, a sensible dialogue. And therefore, most of these kind of uh, questions that you just pointed out mm. uh, that uh, who decides, mm. this sort of question will come up. Th these are obfuscating questions. Mm. First of all, the problem has begun the moment you have started intervening without a definite perspective okay mm. that perspective should naturally uh, should organically uh, come up mm. it is not something that should be uh, thrust upon you from above okay I see. but 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 you need to be given ample opportunities to survey all sorts of existing literature without sidelining a particular kind of literature, this kind of literature, that kind of literature, without mm. giving too much of emphasis on any one particular kind of literature. Mm. So once that sort of uh, level playing field is given to a budding uh, student or scholar, mm. only then this sort of organic, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, flourishing uh, an organic realization of which uh, perspective is going to fit for my purpose will dawn on the scholar or the student mm. and then the rest can uh, happen from there i, mm. I mean I, i'm speaking from uh, pure personal experience in this case and i've mm. seen uh, a number of people who, who share a similar kind of experience mm. where uh, simply because they have uh, refused to be uh, you know confined within the uh, syllabi or the curriculum that mm. uh, your teacher, your professor, and your university department has uh, prescribed for you. Mm. Uh, therefore, they have been able to explore beyond. And uh, thanks to the internet, which is you know a very very uh, critical uh, mm. tool in, in in making this change, making this mm. shift. Uh, I think it was pretty difficult before mm. the 2000s or the late 1900s, uh, so 1990s. Mm. Sorry. Uh, for this sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, exploration mm. outside of the prescribed syllabi mm. and curricula. So, um, that's it. That's that. Right. 
so now then for the main question that exactly how do we indianize the humanities what would be the uh, step by step procedures that any any hod or principal or the government needs to take yeah so i think we should begin at the beginning which is language okay. because uh, uh, language is the very basis of thought hmm. and uh, uh, we are basically talking about uh, thought heavy disciplines right, because right. we are talking about analysis hmm. uh, in ideas we yeah. are trying to explore ideas hmm. and we are trying to sort of uh, evaluate those ideas on the basis of specific perspectives right okay which is why i uh, i i spoke very strongly in favor of uh, making up one's mind before they venture into mm. the creation of new knowledge mm. right so language is the very basis of thought mm. you know uh, as we have seen in the vedic dictum vang me manasi pratishthita mano me vachi pratishthita that thought is rooted in speech and speech is rooted in thought mm. vice versa mm. so we have to basically look at what sort of language we are teaching our children are we mm. giving them the uh, uh, mother tongue in which uh, they were born whether that mother tongue is preserved in the family in the nuclear family where they uh, are being raised mm. and what sort of environment can be created for people who are uh, uh, who have migrated from one state to another right. which is which is a very big uh, uh, you know phenomenon which is a reality hmm. basically of the indian middle class these days hmm. and uh, even beyond i'm not uh, uh, you know uh, prescribing this just just for the middle class hmm. for uh, for uh, the uh, indian society as a whole i yeah. think we should emphasize on uh, at least the primary and uh, the uh, uh, the the middle school level uh, Mm. education mm. to happen in a big way mm. in a big way not completely not exclusively mm. but in a big way in the language of at least the parent okay mm. so thankfully in the national education policy 2020 we have seen some baby steps have been taken mm. towards this Mm. such as they have spoken about uh, uh, teaching multiple languages including the mother tongue mm. such as they have spoken of uh, creating posts for language teachers mm. uh, multiple language teachers mm. keeping in mind the, the the possibility that in a particular city or in a particular uh, area in a state there may be uh, people who speak different languages mm. okay sometimes from outside of those states as well so they have started speaking of uh, creating provisions and posts positions uh, for teachers who can uh, teach multiple languages mm. so some baby steps have been taken in terms of showing intent to build the right kind of policy mm. but there's a long long way to go right we have to emphasize that other than english we have to learn english we have to have english uh, as uh, our second language and we have to gain we, we we need to ensure that our children gain uh, professional level expertise in uh, uh, english in using english but at the same time we have to ensure that they are organically connected with uh, mm. the language of at least one of their parents if not the mm. language of both because many in many cases we have seen that uh, the parents are coming from different cultural or linguistic yeah. backgrounds that yeah. is also the possibility yeah. so at least uh, one parents mother tongue mm. uh, should be the large chunk of uh, the primary and middle school education of the child mm. otherwise this sort of exploration that i have uh, just uh, spoken about you know to show the intent of refusing uh, to be confined within the prescribed curricula that sort of freedom itself is negated at the very beginning because you do not know the language mm -hmm. i mean if you are uh, the child of uh, bengali parents who have shifted to let's say noida mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you are born in noida you have brought up in noida you have been brought up in noida and the only languages that you have at your disposal are let's say hindi and uh, uh, english because maybe you go to uh, an upscale english medium school hmm. 
how are you going to discover, explore, let's say, Bonkim? How are you going to explore Vivekananda? Mm. How are you going to explore Rabindranath? Mm. Many, many uh, works of these people who I just mentioned are still un un untranslated. And therefore, the only way to connect with them, to connect with their ideas, not with uh, these persons as uh, some, um, you know, uh, figures who should be revered and worshipped mm. by putting them on a pedestal. But mm. simply to engage with their ideas and ideals, mm. you need to know the language. Mm. So therefore, I think, first of all, we need to ensure for the uh, for the future scholar or the future student to have that freedom, to exercise that freedom of exploring beyond their prescribed curricula, they need to know at least one language coming from their parentage, mm. coming from their parents' lineage, mm. cultural lineage. Right. Okay. Secondly, they need to be given the kind of uh, uh, training in any one of the traditional Indian performing arts or plastic arts. This is something that is essential. This is not optional. Okay. I'm saying this again from uh, personal experience and as uh, uh, on the basis of my experience as a uh, design educator. Okay. So I have seen that only such people who have had, who have taken up in their young age, at least one Indian classical performing art or plastic art. What they is plastic art? So painting or, uh, you know, uh, sculpting, these I sort see. of things, or carving, wood carving. Oh, okay. So if you have uh, picked up a skill right from, uh, let's say, the age of eight or 10 mm. to be able to sing Hindustani classical music or mm. Carnatic music or to uh, any of the classical dance forms like uh, Kathakali or Bharatanatyam, mm. okay? Or if, if you have been trained uh, in painting, in sculpting in the traditional way, then a new uh, aspect of the world, a new paradigm, a new dimension of the world opens up before you. Mm. And it helps you in a very, very big way to get connected to your cultural roots. Mm. Okay. Personally, for me, it has been a very big help because I have been practicing classical music, Hindustani classical music from a very young age, thanks to I my see. parents. And therefore, even uh, though I was uh, uh, put through the kind of run of the mill education that most of our, uh, you know, middle class uh, people uh, and, and children go through, mm. you know, like a Sarkari school and then uh, one of the, uh, uh, the upscale colleges, uh, mm. I went to St. Xavier's. Mm. And uh, then I went to uh, Jadavpur University. Mm. So during those times, uh, the one connection, you know, the one very thin connection that I had with the culture of my country and the mind of my country, okay, mm. was music, was through music. Mm. You know, I could rely upon the padas, the, mm. the, the, the compositions, the vanis of mm. our poet saints or saint poets, mm -hmm. you know, the Sant, the Kavis and the Rishis, starting from the Vedic era down to the Middle Ages, let's say Mirabai's Bhajan mm -hmm. or uh, Surdas's Bhajan, mm -hmm. and then coming down to uh, the Indian Renaissance or Bengal Renaissance, the results of, uh, you know, the Shakta Padavali, Vaishnava Padavali, you know, coming to us through the through the filter of right. uh, the Renaissance, mm -hmm. coming through Rabindranath, for example, mm. coming through uh, Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, for example. So that sort of connection is essential. Mm. Once you have ensured these two level uh, filters, firstly, through the language, one of the Indic languages, okay, uh, if, if possible too, I would suggest also to take up Sanskrit, but mm. but I, I think that's, that's, a, that's a very difficult one to make. Mm. At least uh, their mother tongue and secondly any of the Indian performing or plastic arts mm. okay once these two have been ensured in the education of a child right from the very beginning mm. then at least they have the freedom and the 
different different dimensions to explore all sorts of things in this uh, age of uh, internet and ai hmm. next what we can do as scholars is to apply our uh, you know hard earned nationalist perspective i'm talking about people like me who need to come up with more and more new knowledge production they should write you know voraciously they should read and write uh, in journals they should right. churn up new books mm. they should engage in lecturing and uh, podcasts even using mainstream media and social mm. media and only through that yeah. we can create a sustainable body of literature which then can be used yeah. by any policy maker by any government by any hod you know right. which was your question mm. we cannot blame them alone exactly we have to first create a body of literature mm. on which they can draw right and only then if they have not drawn upon that sort of literature mm. we can point our fingers to them yeah and then we can hold them to account mm. okay right so these are the three layers firstly right. language mm. secondly performing art or plastic art based on the indian tradition okay mm. the kalas there are mm. 64 such kalas you have to take up one kala at least mm. okay and thirdly you have to go on creating a, a sizable amount of literature which right. the policy maker can draw upon which the academic can draw upon. the academic administrator can draw up hmm. right sir since your first very first point was uh, language then uh, and, and uh, i know from your uh, social media posts that you are in fact a big defender of raja ramon roy when some people from the non left criticize him including me <coughs> uh the, the most infamous thing raja ramon roy i guess did was write that letter where he uh, basically uh, did a very a strong an argument against uh, against starting the sanskrit college uh, he thought that why what's the point of uh, studying sanskrit because we are only going to be en- ending up learning philosophy uh, mm-hmm. why couldn't he ask for teaching everything in sanskrit because that was simply not possible you need to have uh, you know even if even if you wanted to start uh, a university or an institution mm-hmm. where everything starting from uh the new field of humanities which was also burgeoning right in that time in europe in mm. places like germany and england and france mm. especially if you need to be able to understand them to digest them and then come to a sort of assimilation of those disciplines mm. and then put them into sanskrit mm. need to know those fields and where right. will you and how will you learn those mm. only by picking up the the language of the colonizer Hmm. who also happen to be uh the the creator of the new knowledge okay hmm. that is something that is undeniable hmm. i mean it is good to say that uh, uh, uh somebody should be defending sanskrit hmm. i also defend sanskrit yes. and uh unbeknownst to many people uh, who bash raja ramon roy hmm. raja ramon roy himself defended sanskrit hmm. but in their proper places hmm. for example he started at hedua not far from college street uh an anglo hindu school hmm. this is the school where maharshi devendranath tagore was first admitted as a child okay. and because he was admitted in, into this school he was able to study both english as well as sanskrit hmm. because as you know raja ramon roy was a big proponent he was the first in fact proponent in the modern age of vedanta okay before that people in bengal at least had forgotten about vedanta hmm. they simply did not care about it apart right. from a few uh, experts okay. and those experts were nowhere near close to uh, imagining hmm. that uh, vedanta knowledge can be of use hmm. to the non experts hmm. to laymen like you and me right. okay so it was a revolutionary thing that raja ramon roy defended uh, english education at that time because without that sort of a defense we wouldn't have uh, you know the hindu college and if right. we did not have the hindu college mm. we would not have the presidency college mm. and if we did not have the presidency college we would not have people like vinay sarkar radha kumar mukherjee mm. shotish chandra mukhopadhyay 
Narendranath Dutt, mm. Swami Vivekananda, who also studied in presidency for some time. Mm. And uh, uh, and also, uh, I'm forgetting another very, very big name, which is a critical name, I think, that is Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya, K.C. Bhattacharya. Mm. Okay. Now, if you look into K.C. Bhattacharya's case, let's take him up. Then we will understand what Raja Ram Mohan Roy really did. Okay. What was K.C. Bhattacharya doing? He was born, if I'm not wrong, uh, sometime in the 1880s. Okay. And uh, he lived up to 1949. Okay. So, K.C. Bhattacharya was the first Indian who had written a commentary on the philosophy of Immanuel Kant okay. using the methodology of the Vedanta scholars commentary. I see. Now you tell me how that could have been possible without first not just understanding but digesting Immanuel Kant's philosophy. Hmm. First of all, you have to digest that. Okay, hmm. it's very very difficult Kant's philosophy to digest it, hmm. and then you have to also digest your own tradition, which is the Vedanta commentarial tradition, hmm. something that has come to us right from the time of Gaudapada, hmm. you know, the teacher of uh, uh, the teacher of Shankaracharya, okay. and from that time onwards, the the great commentarial tradition. Uh, or the method, I, I wouldn't just call it a tradition, it's actually a specific methodology that all these uh, traditional scholars uh, like Adi Shankaracharya, not hmm. least of whom is Adi Shankaracharya, right. have given us. So, digesting both these streams and assimilating them, this sort of human resource, hmm. even though I am not very fond of this term human resource, I'm using it in this hmm. case. That sort of human resource, mm. the creation of that sort of human resource was very, very critical. Mm. And if we did not have Raja Ram Mohan Roy writing those uh, letters to Lord Amherst mm. uh, and defending uh, vigorously the cause of English education mm. and uh, you know protesting uh, the, 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 the wastage of resources, government resources, mm. into setting up another Sanskrit college, mm. uh, we wouldn't have uh, Kesi Bhattacharya. Okay, mm. and the very reason that you and I are talking about these issues today, mm. I think, can be traced back to that letter that that infamous letter mm. that Raja Ram Mohan Roy had written. Mm. And uh, if you if you ask me, uh, why why couldn't we have uh, come to this sort of a situation where we are discussing this? Uh, maybe we could have discussed this in Sanskrit, and that would have been even better. Mm. I would again I would again uh, tell you that. Uh, you know, uh, this, this is something that I had uh, made some posts on uh, only, I think, yesterday or day before. Okay. Uh, the way the ways in which uh, casteism mm. has worked in 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 Bengali society, mm. in the Hindu society of Bengal. Mm. Okay. So uh, because of that casteism, mm. in the first place, you wouldn't have any access to uh, this discourse of uh, Vedanta. Okay. I see. Uh, one has to know the kind of uh, pains that Raja Ramon Roy had to go through in order to simply democratize the knowledge of Vedanta. Mm. He was the first person who had argued that the Shudra can, without any harm, without any fuss, mm. listen to uh, the Vedanta translated into Bengal. Mm. Okay, when he when he was the first translator of uh, the Vedanta in any Indian language, in mm. any yeah. modern Indian language, I should say. Mm. So, uh, when he first translated uh, the Upanishads, mm. which which are parts of the Veda, mm. okay, which is Shruti, mm. and uh, therefore uh, he committed, according to the orthodox Hindus of his times, a mm. sacrilege by mm. translating the Shruti into the spoken language. Okay, mm. in in Bangla we say Eto Bhajava. He had mm. basically made them made those Shrutis Eto. Mm. Okay. When uh, people, you know, protested this sort of translation work of Ram Mohan, hmm. uh, the main reason that they uh, had shown is that the Shudra is not uh, Adhikari of uh, listening to the Vedas, the Shudra. Right. Do you know what Raja Ram Mohan Roy said? Raja Ram Mohan Roy made it categorically clear that uh, the Shudra has been listening to the stories of Ramayana and Mahabharata yeah. in the translation of Kalida, uh, in Kritivasa and uh, Kashidas, hmm. right? So, if uh, 
that sort of and also from the time of sri chaitanya mahaprabhu hmm. many of the bhagavata stories hmm. which are all written in sanskrit ramayana of valmiki vyasas mahabharata and also vyasas bhagavata purana hmm. the great uh, body of literature uh, for uh, you know the hindus hmm. all of those had at least in part translated into bengali and the shudra has been listening to that uh, yeah. translated sanskrit word. so therefore they, they, it is not going to create a new problem if mm. uh, he translated the upanishads and, and he also translated the gita mm. uh, by the by the way mm. so uh, he defended uh, you citing the bengali tradition of uh, the translation mm. okay so i i don't think that uh, it would have been possible to come to uh, a place where we could start to gain a sense of nationhood first mm. of all mm-hmm. and what kind of a nation who not a restricted nation not a sort of uh, uh, wells in a uh, sorry frogs in a well sort of a nation hmm. not a parochial nation hmm. some and that that would have been totally counterproductive for us because that had been one of the main reasons and raja ramon roy had correctly understood it hmm. because we had become frogs in a well hmm. we could not really engage with the external world effectively in terms of not just intellectual ways but also political ways okay okay and therefore we succumbed so easily to the greater political as well as economic and intellectual might of uh, you know the foreign people okay so so only because we have uh, been placed in that sort of a peculiar situation in history mm. uh, in uh, the early 19th century we are now uh, at least thankfully uh, beginning to clarify our notions of perspective hmm. sir then uh, wouldn't it be possible to learn just english as a second language or just one language and then read kant in english in the otherwise sanskrit college would the british have prevented the shudras also from entering or or would the british not be able to prevent the uh, brahmin pandits from from hating shudras because so many white foreigners learned they were not neither brahmin nor shudra yeah but you have to see we as indians we have this peculiar discriminatory attitude towards the white skinned hmm. okay you can see Fair that uh, still still in today's time yeah. if you visit a five star hotel Absolutely. or a restaurant you hmm. can really see what sort of treatment that uh, we brown people are hmm. getting and what uh, the uh, white skinned people are getting hmm. so that that same trait had been operational in hmm. the minds of the brahmin scholars uh, mm-hmm. uh, of the time right not just brahmin scholars the scholars there were some kayastha scholars as well okay, okay. ram ram boshu was somebody who was teaching uh, bengali to the okay. uh, englishman in fort william college uh, ram ram boshu is actually the first uh, uh, person to have created bengali prose okay oh. many people think that raja ramon roy had created it but that is not true okay. ram ram boshu is the person who had created bengali prose some people even say that william carey had created in the book that okay. is not okay okay so anyway the problem was twofold first this discriminatory attitude of the indian and secondly there was another very uh, conspicuous uh, characteristic of the uh, british administrator of hmm. the eic of the british uh, east india east company india. administrators hmm. that they decided as a matter of policy not to intervene in the religious or social customs yeah, yeah. of hindus as well as muslims okay of india hmm. therefore therefore hmm. they said that let them have their uh, you know diwani uh, systems hmm. you know which is uh, you know the personal laws the hindu should have his personal law the muslim should have his personal law <laughs> uh, and uh, they should uh, never intervene in the religious customs including sati okay hmm. which is why ram mohan roy had to had to basically Uh, team up with the unitarians in order mm. to gain uh, support mm. from the fledgling feminists mm. of the west mm. mainly based in the usa and uh, uh, in england mm. okay so uh, the british was very very cautious uh, in terms of not intervening into mm. the social and religious uh, spheres of indians at that mm. time so therefore the kind of possibility that you just mentioned that mm. why why wouldn't the british uh, simply create an institution where everybody could just come mm. uh, irrespective of their birth caste creed religion and uh, take 
partake, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the knowledge of Sanskrit. Mm. That was simply not going to be possible. In fact, mm. the British were very, very particular that only Brahmin scholars uh, would be the heads of such institutions. Right. And, uh, you know, they had created this, uh, in, in this college, this uh, Sanskrit college mm. in Banaras at mm. that time. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the, the Sanskrit college in uh, uh, Calcutta, mm. again in College Street, mm. uh, 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 was something that came up later, okay, mm. with which the Raja had uh, uh, had a problem and he had expressed his uh, uh, disagreement mm. to Lord Amherst. So that is that is a, a very peculiar situation. We need to understand the, the historical situation of that time. What sort of intention the British had? What yeah. sort of uh, orthodox mentalities that our people, our, our Indians of mm. various castes had? Mm. And only by uh, knowing these two factors, we will be able to really appreciate mm. from what position Raja Raghavan Rai was coming at mm. it. So are you saying then the, the Indian caste system or the casteism, the bad behaviors coming from caste, they were distinctly so evil that all other, uh, no other basically colonized society where they were, they managed to kick out the uh, settler uh, colonizers, they did not completely anglicize themselves, only we did. Uh, was it because of di distinctly evil caste, caste system? Sorry, your question is not very clear to me. You sort of... Uh, and no country it. other than India who faced colonization mm. is only speaking English, right? No, that is not the case. That is okay. not the case. What would you speak of? What would you then uh, uh, say about Nigeria, for example? Hmm. Okay. Nigerians are using only English when it comes to official matters or higher education, hmm. right? What would you speak of uh, the First Nations of Canada, for example, hmm. or of New Zealand? I mean, it's good to see from time to time some people doing some uh, warrior dance in the New Zealand uh, Parliament. Hmm. Okay, that's 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 just optics. Yeah, my uh, dear uh, New Zealand, I'm not counting because it's already a settler colonized society. But let's say how yeah. how did uh, Japan, South Korea, China manage without learning English? No, no. The story of Japan and China completely that's completely different okay. because the the Japanese and the Chinese did not allow hmm. the British to gain that sort of, uh, you know, all pervading okay. control in their political as well as economic systems. The okay. only, uh, the only sphere where the, where the British had actually made a dent hmm. in the Chinese and uh, Japanese, society, especially in the Chinese society was economic. Hmm. Okay. They, they had captured their economy. Hmm. And for Japan, uh, because of the kind of medieval structure of the society that continued right down to the 19th century, hmm. they were able to uh, analyze the, the effects of uh, the, this new culture coming from uh, the West mm. uh, on their own terms. Okay? Mm. They, they, they are a warrior society even in 19th century. Yeah, okay? yeah. The, the institution of the, uh, the, 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 what is it called, the Mikado, the, mm. the emperor, was, is there, mm. still there, but now it is, uh, you know, a hopeless case, but uh, at least until 1940s, it was a very powerful institutional thing mm. and people religiously obeyed them okay mm. the allegiance of the japanese was towards the emperor and right before the uh, the reformation in their their culture in uh, i think 1860s and 70s mm. they had a full-fledged feudal society mm. okay our right, situation right. was our situation was not like that mm. we, we we were uh willing in at least in bengal and madras in these mm. two provinces we were much more willing to take up uh, the ways of uh, the Westerner mm. uh, as our own. The Japanese were not so, and mm. uh, it only had to come from the top down. Our mm. case was very bottom up. Okay, mm. our taking up of the Western ways mm. was a more democratic process. Mm. We willingly took it up. Kesi mm. Bhattacharya, whom I gave an example of, mm. writes in his uh, Swarajin ideas, his mm. seminal essay of uh, keeping our uh, domain of thought free, even mm. if we are politically uh, enslaved by the British mm. or anybody else. Mm. He mentions it that we willingly took up uh, English education, we willingly took up the English ways. Mm. Okay, yeah. that was not the case with Japan. The Japanese common man, the Japanese peasant, the Japanese, uh, let's say, trader, middle class, mm. they had to follow a dictum that is coming from the emperor. Mm. And because they have that sort of allegiance to the emperor, they were willingly taking it. Mm. Okay, 
it's not because they had understood the value yeah. of the western culture yeah. like we did mm -hmm. and therefore they're taking it up mm -hmm. and in our case we did not even have that sort of an allegiance to any uh, emperor or raja or maharaja mm -hmm. at least in bengal or in madras mm -hmm. okay yeah. uh, sir then so, yeah yeah uh, i i believe that there are no solutions there are only trade offs so uh, would you say that uh, would it be fair to uh, say that uh, this uh, english language education that we took up especially because raja ramon roy paved the way for us or let's say raja ramon roy was the aspirational model to follow that not only uh, made bengal a progressive society but also therefore deracinated bengal is that why there is a direct correlation between bengal is being deracinated while being also the first ones to take up english language because of raja ramon roy no no i think the okay. uh, this this sort of deracination started in uh, the bengali society because of two very specific reasons okay. one uh, the revolutionary nationalist uh, uh, movement which was uh, basically started with uh, the bongo bongo andolan mm. uh, in 1905 mm. uh, the swadeshi movement uh, got derailed sometime uh, in the late 1920s okay mm. from which time the british were able to uh, you know sort of mix it up with mm. the communists okay mm. Mm. before that communist ideas did not make a dent in bengal okay mm. there were people who were uh, studying it from an intellectual point of view mm. uh, but not no real takers of communism or socialism even communism to bhuli jao not even socialism before 1920s okay it's from the uh, mid 19 mid 1920s or late 1920s that yes. we get to see a political uh, phenomenon that is communism in bengal so mm. that introduction of communism uh, because of the derailing of the revolutionary nationalist right. movement uh, and secondly the partition okay mm. the partition basically uh, disenfranchised a lot of uh, bengali middle class mm. as well as bengali peasant class mm. uh, uh, from their land mm. okay from their resources mm. so uh, as a result of that as a result of that uh, the bengali society started to look upon life itself from a very different way mm -hmm. okay because they are now i mean the most of bengali society the, the larger chunk of it mm -hmm. became the have nots and therefore this story of uh, eternal struggle between the haves and the have nots yeah, yeah. was very easy to sell in this society mm -hmm. okay so the main culprit in this case was the partition i think mm -hmm. and before it the derailing of the revolutionary nationalist movement okay because of because of uh, you know very very uh, uh, systematic uh, spying and intelligence operations that the british did in a very subtle manner some of it has been captured in the uh, recent book by sanjeev sanghi hmm. and i intend to write more on it hmm. uh, in my upcoming book on revolutionary nationalists okay so we are almost at 9 pm uh, do you have any more time to carry on this conversation i can give you some more 15 minutes yeah fair enough uh, sir have you read uh, that uh, debate between raja ramon roy and some something shastri the the book is called uh, in defense of hindu theology uh, yes where, uh, where he has Super argued against i think you are talking about Su yes i think you are talking about the controversy between raja ramon roy and subramanya shastri yes yes so there he he argued against uh, idol worship and brahmo samaj was also known to uh, be against idol worship now do you think the brahmo brahmo samaj was uh, uh, the, the brahmo samaj movement was taken up by uh, mainly bengali upper caste because they thought of themselves as aryans because the aryan invasion theory was very popular and didn't that backfire uh, on on hindus as well the aryan invasion theory and propagating of it because of brahmo samaj no that may be a case but uh, the premise from which you start is mm. not quite uh, correct because okay. the 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 main thrust of the controversy between subramanya shastri and the raja mm. uh, was not uh, simply idol worship it was okay. mainly based on how far uh, you know all castes can have access to uh, the the vedas okay? okay that is one of the things because he was voraciously translating the mm. vedas mm. Uh, specifically the upanishads mm. and uh, secondly whether uh, it was possible to come to a sort of uh, reformed 
uh, state of Hinduism, mm. uh, the Hindu religion, uh, in terms of uh, several issues, in terms of uh, social, in terms of educational, in terms of uh, linguistic, because of this translation issue, and also because of uh, you know the, the the ways of worshiping. Mm. Okay, so ways of worshiping. Uh, Sakara versus Nirakara debate was just yeah. one one uh, you know part of it. Okay. And the upshot of this debate was uh, uh, that Raja Ramon Rai came up uh, as a visible uh, winner of sorts. And because this uh, debate was public, this was mm -hmm. happening as a to and fro of letters. Yeah, yeah. And later it got published in yeah. a book form by mm -hmm. the Raja. So uh, everybody was uh, keeping track of it in the hmm. publications that were coming up, mainly from the Raja's side. And it was also being attested by the other side, okay, right, the yes. orthodox side, led by Raja Radha Kanto. Hmm. Interestingly, maybe uh, some of these people who are, because you also uh, proposed to talk about Bengali sub-nationalism, yes. I think I should mention this, those, uh, those sub-nationalists who uh, think that uh, we should uh, basically uh, target you know, the, the Bengali sub-nationalists should be targeting the uh, people from other states. Mm. They should know that this debate had taken place mainly uh, from the place of a wealthy uh, merchant who hailed from Bihar. Mm. Okay. So that's just as an aside. Mm. But uh, apart from that, the upshot of the debate was that Raja came out to be a visible winner. Okay, mm. And uh, therefore, uh, the uh, thinking people and uh, moneyed people who had some capital and who were also regarded by everybody in Calcutta at that time, at least in the Calcutta Bengali society, as the uh, heads, Shomajir Matha. Hmm. Okay, those people, irrespective of their position uh, in in the Orthodox versus uh, Reform debate, hmm. they uh, embraced. Most of them embraced Raja Ramon Roy as a force of good. Okay. Hmm. Okay. And therefore, therefore, the public opinion started to slowly, slowly shift towards uh, reformism, which uh, gave uh, the Brahmo Samaj movement this upper hand. But let me also add, I think today itself, I was uh, having an interesting discussion with uh, uh, Kanchan Da, Kanchan Gupta, okay. uh, noted, noted uh, yes. journalist, mm. uh, that uh, the uh, Brahmo Samaj movement mm. got an impetus from uh, Moshe Devendra. And uh, if you really look into uh, how Maushi Devendranath basically uh, revived the Brahmo Samaj movement after mm. the sudden demise of Raja Ramon Roy in far away uh, Bristol in mm. uh, England in 1833, there is a 10 year gap okay, between the death of Raja Ramon Roy and the revival of the Brahmo Samaj mm. uh, because uh, Devendranath decided to merge his Tattwa Bodhini Sabha, which was another association yes. that he had formed in order to sort of study and discuss and propagate the tenets of Vedanta. Okay. Mm. And at the time of the Raja's uh, founding of the Brahmo Samaj, uh, even at the time of his death, uh, the, the religion uh, that was discussed in it uh, was not known as Brahmo Samaj. Uh, okay. the, the, the name of that religion officially, you know, in the trust deed document that we have of the founding of the Brahmo Samaj, which comes from 1828, it mentions the religion as Vedanto Pratipadito Dharma. Vedanto Pratipadito Shutta Dharma. Okay? Okay. Which would uh, roughly translate to English as the true religion, hmm. the true dharma, which has been elucidated in the Vedanta. Hmm. Okay? Which has been elucidated as elucidated in the Vedanta. Hmm. So this was the sort of idea with which the Raja had uh, started his work. After that 10 year gap, when Devindranath uh, revitalized uh, the Brahmo Samaj by merging his Tattva Bodhini Sabha. He did not only come with religious ideas, he came with nationalist ideas. And that is where the game started to change. Okay. Devindranath was a very staunch nationalist. Hmm. He refused, even though he was sometime a student of the Hindu college. And he was actually from that generation when the biggest thrust of the young Bengal movement and Derosio hmm. was happening, taking place in. Hindu college. In fact, uh, Derosio teaching in Hindu college and Devendranath being a student in Hindu college is co-temporary. Okay, so okay. they were basically coming from the same time, hmm. uh, and it is not uh, uh, 
uh, impossible that uh, he got uh, Dinozio as his teacher. Uh, but that sort of a person, Devendranath, refused to write or correspond or speak ever in English. This is the contradiction that you should look right. into. Okay, that Raja Ramon Rai was so strongly defending English education, mm. and uh, Morshi Devendranath refused to even speak or correspond in letters with mm. his uh, uh, correspondences, correspondents, mm. uh, many of whom were actually family members uh, in English. Okay, mm. there is a story that uh, one of his close family relations had sent him a letter in English because of some uh, family matter, mm. and he simply refused to write back. Okay. <laughs> he forced that person to realize uh, his fault uh, in terms of Devinora's perspective and only then he could actually begin correspondence with him. Anyway, so the nationalist perspective uh, got injected into the Brahmo Samaj movement thanks to Devinora. Okay? Okay. Devinora had uh, made it a point that uh, conversion of uh, Bengalis uh, would be stopped in places like Duff College. Okay. Uh, Alexander Duff had started this college, which which is something that uh, because Ramon was so uh, generous to all his friends, he, he, sometimes even to his enemies, uh, Ramon had actually helped him get a place in order to start his school. And after his demise, we got to see that uh, Duff had started uh, converting people uh, in a wholesale manner. And this is something that uh, Moshe Devendranath uh, started to uh, be vocal about or vocal against rather. Okay. And when when the orthodox uh, Hindus recognize this potential of Devendranath becoming the leader of the Bengali society, not just of Calcutta, of uh, entire Bengal, because he was also a uh, zamindar who had estates in both Eastern Bengal, in uh, uh, Western Bengal, in today's West Bengal, and also in today's Odisha. Okay, mm. so he had estates in his various places. Therefore, he had good connections all across Bengal. Okay, mm. that times undivided Bengal. I'm talking about. And therefore, he emerged as an undisputed leader of the Bengali Hindu Samaj. I see. Okay? Even Radhakanta Dev had accepted him as the force, the only force who could stop conversion in uh, you know places like Alexander Duff's College. And therefore, they had collaborated in order to start the Hindu Hitarthi Vidyalaya. Okay? okay, where uh, where uh, you know the same kind of education would be given without uh, risking conversion okay mm -hmm. from the name itself you can understand they, this was for the hita of hindu hindu hitarthi they were uh, wanting the hindu to flourish okay mm -hmm. so therefore uh, you get to uh, if you see look into uh, devendranath's work in terms of uh, the brahmo samaj movement you will see that nationalist uh, perspective gets injected in a very big way in ramon's time it was there only in potential form because ramon was starting to talk about what will happen to india if many people uh, of all sorts start coming into uh, india from england so there was this uh, debate uh, in the british parliament that to what extent india should be actually uh, colonized and uh, settled in by the britishers okay mm -hmm. so ramon was of the opinion uh, clear opinion that uh, uh, only the educated and moneyed uh, Britishers should be given permission to settle in India, not anybody. Okay. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, Devendranath would have opposed even that, mm -hmm. and uh, it is because of Devendranath's patronization that we get to see that people like Nabagopal Mitra and Rajna and Boshu could actually become radicals in 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 the context of their time. Okay. Mm. Not radicals in the context of the later generation, that is, uh, Swadeshi movement generation. But in their historical context, people like Nagogopal or Rajnayan Boshu, who had started talking about the superiority of Hinduism over any other religion, including the religion of the colonizer, that is, Christianity, uh, that, uh, that was possible because of the patronization provided by uh, Devendranath. And this patronization was not. A, a sort of secret or uh, you know subtle uh, one it was very open he started the hindu mela Nagogopal mitro okay. and uh, who were who were the main cultural contributors to it all the four children or the or, or, all the five uh, uh, you know the bright children the sons of uh, devendra mm -hmm. uh, okay like uh, dijendranath tagore shottendranath tagore hemendranath tagore and uh, jyotirindranath tagore and robindranath tagore
they were the main cultural uh, contributors to. And then there were people like Rajaran Bushu who were openly talking about the superiority of Hinduism and of uh, the Hindu nation. Okay, so this is something that started coming up only with Devendranath's generation, uh, and therefore the Brahmo Samaj became a sort of uh, bulwark against not only conversion but also this sort of. Uh, 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 overt westernization and complete westernization and denationalization rather of the Bengali society and of, of the Hindu society, of the Indian society as a whole. Okay, mm. so therefore we get to see that the main political movements that are coming up in Bengal, such as the Indian Association or Bharat Sabha, they are started by Brahmins. Okay, Ananda Mohan Bosu and uh, Surendranath Banerjee. Mm. Okay. Uh, Ananda Mohan Bosch was a very prominent Brahmo. Okay. So, uh, and then again, uh, there were people like uh, Vivekananda who had their uh, uh, early association with uh, the Brahmo Samaj yeah. quite clear. He was a fan of uh, Keshav Chandra Shen to begin with. Mm. Later on, uh, became a dissolution with Keshav Chandra mm. and then started to go more frequently to Devendranath. Mm. Okay. Which is why after he became this uh, world celebrity after 1993, when he came back to Calcutta, uh, the first person that he met, you know, apart from his uh, brother monks in uh, Belur Mot, no, not in Belur Mot, back, back then it was uh, actually in Bhag Bajar, where they okay. were located, Bhag Bajar and Boranagar. Uh, the first person apart from them that he made it a point to visit uh, was Devendranath Tagore. Okay. Ruth Harris, who has written a recent uh, uh, biography of uh, Swami Vivekananda, which I have also reviewed for a journal oh. uh, in oct October last year. Has mentioned this uh, incident of uh, the Swami meeting uh, Devendranath Tagore and taking his blessings. Uh, so you can understand the kind of uh, influence that uh, Devendranath had on this emerging nationalist uh, thought leaders, okay, yes. including Swami Vivekananda. Hmm. And what to speak of uh, Rabindranath Tagore? I mean, uh, in another conversation, we can perhaps talk yeah. about the, uh, the, the the contribution that Rabindranath made. Yes, yes. But uh, in this uh, conversation, I would simply mentioned uh, the sidelined historians whom I mentioned, hmm. uh, mainly Horidash Mukhopadhyay and Uma Mukhopadhyay, Horidash and Uma Mukherjee, have written very uh, uh, well documented and well researched books on two conspicuous figures of the Swadeshi movement. One, Brahma Bandhav Mukhopadhyay, one figure who we need to majorly discuss. Uh, who was actually a Catholic uh, sannyasi, but also a Vedantin. It was a very different time. So these are the kind of contradictions that we need to look into. Hmm. And the other person is Shotish Chandra Mukhopadhyay, the person okay. who had started the Dawn Society. Okay. And what was the yeah. common link between, and what, who was the common link between these two? Rabindranath Tagore. Okay. I see. S Sister Nivedita Rabindranath Tagore. These two were basically the uh, people who were at the back and. Uh, in the back background and they were basically the common link between not just uh, these two i mentioned but also bipin pa okay mm. in omanindra tagore's uh, memoir Goroa, we get to see uh, where rinath reminisces how he used to provide shelter even to bipin pa uh, and mm. also manpower including his own nephews like surendranath tagore mm. son of uh, uh, satyendranath tagore uh, in order to fight the atrocities that the British police used to commit on the Swadeshi students at that time. So that is perhaps a you know, different conversation altogether. Mm. But uh, because you uh, urged me to come into this question of the Ramo Samaj and its influence, mm. I thought it pertinent to highlight yes. how after Ramohan Rai, mm. a very different kind of movement uh, was initiated by Moshe Dev and Ronald, and that is the beginning of our nationalist thought. I see. Sir, sir, thank you very much. This was a phenomenal discussion. We need to have have you back many times. I am realizing now there's there's much more. It will be a pleasure. Uh, Kolkata history and Bengali history that we can extract out of you. It will be a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, sir. And I'm very glad that you have started this uh, podcast. I wish you all the best. Thank you, sir. Sir, good night. Good night. Oh. Hi, guys. Uh, let's see if there's any important comment. Course correcting Hindutva. Okay, what what discussion is going on here? Uh, okay, uh, so guys, this was a this was a very very uh, beautiful interesting discussion. 
we'll need to have him back very, very soon uh, just a reminder guys tomorrow uh, evening 4 pm uh, professor salvatore babones joins us on uh, saturday saturday 7:30 pm legendary journalist uh, deep haldar will join us uh, and uh, i haven't announced it yet but uh, so far the uh, if, if if all goes well sunday 8 pm again uh, dr shomode is coming back to discuss just cast jati varna okay uh, so thank you thank you for joining guys good night